Hello, and welcome to lecture six of Type Systems. So in this lecture, we're going to learn about existential types and how to use them for data abstraction. And we're going to extend the termination proof for the systemically typed lambda calculus and good old system T to termination of full system F. And this is one of the highlight results of uh, programming language theory. So I'm like really excited to talk about it. But before I do that, um, I want to talk again about why polymorphism was invented. So, so far in the lectures, we've used polymorphism for two purposes. We've used it to write generic programs that work over many different types of data. And we've also used it polymorphism to model data types by these church encodings. So we can see how you can use polymorphic functions to represent things like integers and lists and booleans and things like that. And once you have these things, like say a list of something, you can also use polymorphism to be polymorphic over the contents of the list. But that was not the actual motivation for introducing pro uh, polymorphism to programming languages. When John Reynolds invented poly, uh, the polymorphic lambda calculus in the mid 1970s, he was actually interested in how to model data abstraction. And this is like one of the most important ideas in computer science. It's something we tell to every student of programming, you should program to an interface not to an implementation. And so what does that mean? So here's a uh, really nice concrete example of this. So all of you have done quite a bit of OCaml programming in 1A, and you you may even have used the ML module system a little bit. And so in the ML module system, there are two ways of talking about modules. You have module signatures and module implementations. And you can think of a signature as sort of a, a type for the module, which tells you the interface that a module is supposed to satisfy. And so here we have a, a module signature for the type of Booleans. So here, what we're doing is we're saying that if you have a module implementing the Boolean interface, then you have to have an abstract type T. And this, we have to have two primitive values of type T. We need a value yes, and we val need a value no, which sort of correspond to true and false. And we need a choose function, which takes an abstract Boolean and tr takes two values of type A and returns a new value of type A. And the, what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to take these two values and switch between these two values based on the value of the Boolean argument. So you return this uh, first take A argument if the Boolean is true, is yes, and you return this one right here if the abstract Boolean is a, is a no. And so this is like sort of the primitive interface for Booleans. And it actually looks quite a bit like the church encoding that we saw for Booleans uh, in, the, in the last lecture. And that's actually not an, that's not an accident, but we'll get to that in a minute. So once you have in, in ML a module signature that says here is a type of module satisfying the Boolean interface, you can implement it in many different ways. So we might implement Booleans with a unit option. So here we might say, all right, I want a unit option to represent my Booleans, and I will use some unit for the uh, uh, yes value, and I'm going to use the none value for the no value. And so in this way, the type unit option has two values and we can use one of them for the yes value and one of them for the no value. And then when we implement choose, we can implement it using pattern matching. So we can say choose v if yes, if no. And if the v, the, the uh, abstract Boolean is a sum unit, we return if yes. And if it's a none, we return the if no value. And so we can switch between uh, these three, these, uh, these two, not three, these two Boolean values. Okay, so that's, that's reasonable, but you might think, okay, this was a little bit boring because the unit option type has exactly two values and 
the um, Boolean type has exact values. So this is really like an isomorphic type. But you can do more interesting things with data abstraction. So here is another implementation of the Boolean interface. And in this implementation, we implement Booleans using the integer type. And we'll say that yes is one and no is zero. And what we can do is we can say, well, we will implement choose by saying, well, if the abstract Boolean that we got back is one, then we'll return if yes, and otherwise we'll return if no. And so you can ask, why is this okay? There are many more integers than Booleans, so why is this implementation okay? And sort of your intuition for data abstraction must be something like, well, all of the uh, elements of this abstract type are produced by the inside by this module implementation and so we only have two uh, two methods or uh, uh, we only have like two methods that can produce an abstract boolean and they're one and zero and so we don't need to worry about the uh, non-zero case and then finally, you know, we talked about church encodings in the last lecture. That's actually just fine as an implementation for Boolean. So here I've given a church encoding style encoding of Booleans. So this type I've written right here is how OCaml represents these uh, higher kind, these uh, polymorphic types. So the notation is a little bit ugly. We say, I want a function which for any type tick A, takes a tick A to a tick A to a tick A. And the yes uh, value is going to be a function that takes two arguments A and B and returns A. And the no value is going to be something that takes two, value, uh, two arguments A and B and it returns B. And so when we call choose, we call the, fun the polymorphic function with the if yes argument and the if no argument. And based on which function it got, it'll either return the first argument or the second argument. And so all three of these implementations are valid implementations of the Boolean interface. And in fact, they're all equivalent. There's no way to write a program that can distinguish them. So, so what we want to do here is we want to look at the Boolean implementation. So here I have a, a buffer full of OCaml code with this very uh, Boolean interface. And so we can run it. And so now we have our three modules, M1, M2, and M3, where M1 implements the Booleans with integers, M2 implements it with a unit option, and M3 implements it with the church encoding. And so we can uh, write a little program that says, okay, uh, I'll call m1.choose and I'll call, um, let's say, m1.yes. And if I give it the two arguments, hello and world, then when we call choose yes, hello world, this is, we want to branch to this, this argument right here, the hello argument. And let's see if it actually does that. Ah, and so it does. And in fact, if we switch it out, it will still return hello. So regardless of the implementation, it's sort of returning the correct branch. And one interesting thing is that we can't pass the wrong Boolean implementation to the wrong choose method. So if we did m3 choose, this is something expecting a function. And if we give it m2 dot yes, this is some unit, well, we wouldn't expect that to work at runtime. And OCaml says, okay, no, no, you can't do that. I have something of type m2 dot t right here. I have something of type m2 dot t and I expected something of m3 dot t. You gave me the wrong implementation of, of Booleans. And so I can't, uh, I can't compile this code. Okay. And so this, in this way, the same, the same uh, interface can be implemented by many different modules. And if you have a piece of client code, you can change the implementation without having to uh, 
um, reveal that the implementation type has changed in the clients. Okay, so this is quite neat, um, but how, we, how can we possibly implement this in system F? So what we've got is we've got a signature, in this case booleans, with an abstract type in it. So if you look at the boolean signature right here, you'll see that we have an abstract type of type T. And we have some concrete implementations, some concrete values of type T, and an operation choose that uses that concrete value. And then we're allowed to implement the other operations of the interface in terms of our choice of concrete representation. And so a client program can't identify the representation type because it sees an abstract type variable rather than the representation. So going over, going back to here, we had m3.choose, which wanted a function. Oh, actually, let's do m1 because that, that uses the integers. So let's do m1.choose. And now what we need here is a, a m1 boolean. So we want an m1 boolean to pass as an argument to this uh, choose function. And if you look in the implementation over here, what you can see is that the implementation is an integer. So let's see what happens if we try to pass a number one. So here we're going to say, well, I know that because I have m1.choose, that abstract type t is really an integer, so I'll give it an integer and see what happens. Ah, and so right here, this is where data abstraction is happening. We have a concrete representation of these abstract booleans in terms of integers, but the type checker is rejecting a uh, an attempt to use that concrete representation where the abstract one is expected. And so the type error says, this expression for number one has the type int, but actually I expected an expression of the type m1.t. And so what has happened is we are now free to change the implementation of M1 and this piece of client code will, uh, will be oblivious to any changes that we make to the implementation. So here's something that did work. Oh, sorry, here's something that did work. And now let's go change the implementation of M1. So let's make this into uh, a type of strings and let's make yes and no as the the strings yes and the literal strings yes and no as the implementations of our booleans and now let's say okay well if you gave if you give me the literal string yes then it, I'll return the if yes and if you give me the literal string no then I'll return if no and otherwise um, a crash because there's no other way to produce these ele elements of abstract type. So now let's recompile it and now let's rerun our client program m1.choose m1.yes hello world and lo and behold it continues to work even though we changed the implementation type and that's because the client knows nothing at all about the uh, about the concrete implementation. So the client code can't identify the representation type. And so as a implementer, you're free to change that uh, representation type without breaking any clients, um, as long as all the functions continue to do the same thing. Okay, so let's try to encode this pattern into type theory. So we're going to introduce a new type constructor, exists alpha dot a. And we're going to introduce a new term former, which we'll call pack. And so we'll pack an, uh, an abstract uh, type representation and um, implementation. And we'll also have an unpack form, which says if you have something of existential type, you can unpack it and bind the, uh, the abstract type to a, a new type variable and the implementation to a new term variable. And so if you look at the rules, what you can see here is we have, we're writing our module type as exists alpha.b. So the alpha right here is our abstract type and the implementation, all the uh, uh, 
terms that are the fields of this module are sort of bundled together in this single type B. So if you imagine you have three, uh, three fields, yes, no, and choose, we can represent this in system F using a, a, a tuple. Okay, and so what does pack A, E mean? Well, what we want is we want to know that B is a type with alpha as a free variable. So this alpha dot B is sort of our module signature. And we need to know that A is a well-formed type. And we need to know that the implementation E has the type B when we replace the abstract type alpha with the concrete uh, implementation type big A. So we're saying alpha is our abstract type and B is our, our interface that uses that abstract type. And if we choose A as the implementation type for that abstract type, the implementation of all the, uh, of the rest of the module has to have the type B uh, with A for alpha. Okay, and so this is sort of a first class module construct that we're adding to system F. And so if we have a, a, a module of type exists alpha dot A, and we have a piece of code E prime, which has the type C, then what we'll do is we'll say, well, our client is not allowed to know what the actual representation is. And the way we'll model this is we'll say, well, we're going to introduce a fresh type variable alpha into the context, and we're going to introduce a, a binding for a fresh term variable of type big, a big A into the context, and then the term E prime, the client, is allowed to use the term variable X at the type A, but all of its... Uh, all of its references to the abstract type are just to a type variable. And finally, the whole computation has to have a type C. And when you use an existential type, the implementation type, the abstract type, can't leak into the result. Um, and that's just for scoping reasons, because the scope of this alpha ranges over the E prime, and the whole expression you know, has to be typed in a context where there is no, where there is no alpha. All right. so. These are the typing rules for existential types. And then we can give some operational rules for them. So the first two rules will be congruence rules. We'll say that if we have a pack expression, pack A comma E, and E steps to E prime, then pack A E will step to pack A E prime. So what we're doing is we're saying the module body gets evaluated until it's a value. And then when we want to unpack a module expression E, well, what we have to do is we have to evaluate this E to a value, so pack A comma V. And so we have a congruence rule that says as long as E steps to E prime, then let pack alpha X equals E in T is going to step to let pack alpha X equals E prime in T. So we're just evaluating the module expression until it gives us a value, which is a pack form. And if we do have a pack form, then what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, we want to evaluate E um, with bindings for alpha and x. And our module value says, well, I've, uh, for alpha, I've got a representation type A. And for the implementation x, I've got a concrete implementation V. So what you want to do is you want to substitute A for alpha, and this will concretize that abstract type. And then we want to substitute V for X. And that's the actual implementation of the, uh, of the module, which you can actually use now. And once you've done that, we have added existential types to system F. And this existential type, it looks a bit abstract, but it it's actually derives very, very directly from these module signatures. So this type B with alpha as a free variable corresponds to the signature with an abstract type in it. So if you look over here in the signature for the Boolean, this abstract type T is a, um, it corresponds to this type field, type T. And if you look, yes and no and choose all refer to T. And so yes and no and choose, their types are only well formed under the assumption that you have a T. And so 
what we want to do is we want to say, well, we're, for, we're implementing a module right here, and we have got to give a concrete implementation of the abstract type. And in OCaml, the way we do that is over here with, with this module M1, we're saying, well, this abstract type T is really a string. And so now we have to have a implementation of yes, that's a string, an implementation of no, that's a string, and a choose function that takes a string and a tick A and another tick A and returns the first argument if you got the true one and the second argument if you got the false one. So the type of choose is here is choose has the type string, arrow, tick A, arrow, tick A to tick A. And the type of yes is string and the type of no is string. And so then once we've instantiated that abstract type with a rep concrete representation type, we need to implement all the operations of the interface in terms of the concrete representation. So if we chose, again, if we chose string as the representation of the Booleans, then both yes and no need to be strings, and the choose operation needs to be string arrow tick A, arrow tick A, arrow tick A. Okay? And then when we use the uh, uh, use the module, so we're saying let pack alpha comma x equals e, where e is some module expression in e prime, all e prime gets to see is it gets to know that there was an abstract type chosen by e, but it doesn't know which one, and all it knows is that there is an implementation of a, but again, you don't know what it is. You can't look at it. And the way that we, we represent this property is by saying you get a variable for the abstract type and the implementation. You can't go under the covers. You can only use what's in the interface. Okay, and so this notation exists alpha dot uh, exists alpha dot b for abstract types. It's not an it's not an accident that we're saying exists here. So the rules that we just gave for packing up modules are exactly the rules for existential quantification in second order logic. There's like no difference at all. So the rules for existential types correspond to the way that we use abstract types in programming. And so this fact was discovered not in, 19, not in the 1970s, but well over a decade later, in fact, almost 15 years later, by, uh, by Mitchell and Plotkin in 1988. They wrote a famous paper called Abstract Types Have Existential Type, and they worked out the analogy between existential types in logic and abstract types in programming. And so this was like one of a, this was like sort of a revelation to the programming language design community because it gave like a very, very concrete recipe for how you can think about uh, modules in programming languages. But if you remember back to the beginning of the lecture, I said that Reynolds was thinking about data abstraction in 1974 or 1976. So he was thinking about that well, long before this fact about existential types was discovered. So you can wonder how how on earth did he could he do so? Like if a module is an existential type, an original old school system F didn't have any existential types, how can you use system F to think about data abstraction? And the answer is our old friend the church encoding. And so if you look right here, we've got our rules for introducing and eliminating existentials. So if we want to form an existential, exists alpha dot b, what we do is we say, well, we are going to choose a concrete implementation type a, and then we're going to check that e has the type b with big A for alpha. So we've chosen a representation type for the uh, uh, for the abstract type, and then we check that we can give it uh, an implementation that lives up to the uh, to the claim uh, to the chosen uh, that's well typed with the chosen concrete representation. Okay, fine. 
And when we want to use an existential type, we say, well, I want a client, which is this E prime here. So, and my client program has to work no matter what the specific choice of the, uh, uh, of the representation type was, and it has to work no matter what the specific implementation was. So E prime, the client, is not allowed to look at how the, uh, uh, at any details of the implementation. All we know is encapsulated in this existential type, exists alpha dot b, and those are the only facts that E prime is allowed to know about. And so, if you remember back to how church encodings work, church encodings work by saying, well, let's quantify over all possible uh, clients. And then we'll represent the introduction form by a function that's parameterized by all possible clients. And so we can encode the existential type, exists alpha dot b, by saying, well, no matter what the client type here is, and so in this exi uh, exist elimination rule, we say, well, we have C as a client type, and over here, we're gonna quantify over all possible client types. And then we say, well, the E prime has to work for any alpha and any B. And so we say, okay, well, if you give me a function that takes an alpha and, a B, gives, me, and gives me a B, then I will produce something of this arbitrary type beta, then the whole thing produces beta. And so what we want to do is we want to encode the, uh, the existential introduction by quantifying over all possible clients. And we're, so what we'll say is, okay, for any, t uh, any client type beta, if you give me a continuation that works for any Ex any implementation type alpha and any implementation B, I will give you a beta. Well, we want to produce a beta, and the only way we can do that is by saying, okay, continuation, the actual choice of implementation is A, and the actual implementation is the expression E. And so this pack expression says, is going to be implemented by something that says, well, if you tell me what you want to do with this pack expression, then I'll just give it A and E. And once you have that, the implementation of the let pack rule is going to say, give me the module, and I will tell it what the client type is, and I will tell it what continuation to use. So E prime here has a free type variable alpha and a free term variable X. And so that means we can just lambda abstract over it. And so now we have a function which can take any uh, representation type and any concrete implementation and then execute E prime. And so if we do that, we'll be able to see that the reductions of the uh, of the existential types are simulated by this church encoding. So exactly the same way that it works for natural numbers and things like that, it'll work for existentials as well. And the only difference is that this encoding is trickier. So we have a for all on the left of an arrow, and this is not something that's easily expressed in a language like ML because it makes type inference harder. But M uh, system F has no type inference. You tell it all the instantiations. So we don't need to restrict ourselves for that reason. Okay, so here is where we're going to check that beta reduction works for the church encoding. So if we're trying to unpack a module that was just built with a pack expression, so pack A comma E, and we want to use it in E prime, well, let's see what happens by unfolding some definitions. So the let pack expression is actually says, well, take your module and give it the expected return type C and this continuation E prime, we package up in a function. So the free vari extra free variables of E prime are alpha and X. And so we're going to lambda abstract over them. And so now we've a lambda abstracted over them, we can unfold the definition of pack. And so that says, well, give me a big, la a big lambda over beta, a lambda over k, which is the continuation, and then apply k to a and e. So give k 
the concrete implementation type A and the concrete implementation E. And now we'll pass it some two additional arguments and we can do some beta reductions. First, we'll substitute C for beta to do a beta reduction on that big lambda. And so this occurrence of beta will get replaced with C. And now we have a lambda expression with an argument, and so we can reduce that as well. So we'll substitute k with the abstracted over continuation e prime, and what do we get? And we get lambda alpha x of e prime. And now we can beta reduce twice more. First, we can substitute a for alpha to step through this big lambda, and then we can substitute e for x um, into a for alpha in e prime. And this is exactly the reduction rule that we gave, the beta, the beta reduction for the existential type. And so we are able to show that the evaluation rules for the existential type can be simulated using just the for all quantifier. So it's not just Da uh, booleans and simple data that we can encode in system F. It's not just data like numbers and lists that we can encode in system F. We can even encode modules and abstract types in system F. So for a language with three, ty with three types and five term formers, we have a huge amount of expressive power in it. And as a result of this, System F has been the subject of intensive study for almost 50 years now, just because it packs so much power into such a tiny little package. Okay, so again, let's come back and look at this language. So we've got three type formers, five term formers, and just two value forms. So the whole of System F can be fit onto a single slide here. So here we've got all of the uh, reduction rules for system F, and we can ask, well, how do we know that we haven't made system F too powerful? So we've shown that it can encode all kinds of uh, iteration over data, but can it encode full general recursion as well? Can we make, write an infinite loop? And the answer is no, or rather, I have asserted that system F terminates, but I haven't proved it yet. So there's a whole lot of expressive power here, but what we haven't done yet is show that we haven't like made the language too powerful or so powerful that we've broken logical consistency. Okay, and so that's what we're going to do in the rest of the lecture. So if you remember, the way that we proved termination for the simply typed lambda calculus was by defining a logical relation. And so what we did was we gave a family of relations, one for every single uh, type, and we defined these relations by recursion on the structure of the type. We said what the relation was for the base types, like 0 or 1, and then in terms of those uh, in, uh, relations a smaller type, we used it to define the interpretation of a relation at a larger type. So if you see a function type like A arrow B, its interpretation was defined in terms of the interpretations for A and the interpretations for B. And so what this did was it gave, enforced a property that was a bit stronger than termination. We wanted to prove termination, but we couldn't do it directly because when we did, we got stuck at the function application case. And so what logical relations let us do is they let us implement a kind of hereditary termination property. So at function types, we don't just say that the term terminates. We say, well, it terminates, but also if you give me a terminating argument, the whole application will terminate as well. And so if you try to extend this idea directly to system F, you're going to run into two critical problems. The first is how do you interpret type variables? So if you see a type variable alpha, what's its interpretation? It's some arbitrary type variable and you're allowed to substitute any type you like for it. So how can you interpret a type variable in a logical relation? And the second question is, how can you interpret quantifiers? If you see the, the type expression for all alpha dot a, how do you give 
a logical relation for that case. So, so doing something really straightforward is a bit tricky because we think that when you see for all alpha dot a, you're allowed to substitute any type of b that you like for, uh, for that alpha. So somehow it has to subsume the behavior of all of its possible instantiations. Okay, so in our, before we answer that question, I want to recall that when we proved termination for the simply typed lambda calculus, before we started looking at the actual typing derivations or anything like that, after we defined the logical relation, what we did was we checked that it satisfied two properties. The first was the halting property. If E is in a uh, in a in a, uh, a relation a in a in a relation for a type, then E halts. So no matter what type you choose from the logical relation, if E is in it, then E is definitely going to halt. And secondly, we wanted to show that if we have a, that one of these uh, sets of terms, these sets were closed under reduction. So if E steps to E prime, then E prime is in X if and only if E is in X. So if you have a term and you evaluate it either forwards or backwards, whatever you get is still in the relation. And so we can, t we can say, well, we needed these two properties when we were proving termination, and that's why we proved them. And so what we can do is we can define a, no a generic notion of semantic type, and we can say a semantic type is any set of terms which satisfies this halting condition and this closure condition. And then we can use this to interpret variables. And so the idea is we can say, well, if you give me a semantic type interpretation, I have these three constructors. And so every well-formed type is going to have some well-formedness derivation that uses these three rules. And what we can say is that given this type variable context theta, we can define a variable interpretation little theta, which maps everything in the domain of the of the type variable context to some semantic type to some set of terms which is halting and closed under reduction and so given a variable interpretation little theta i'm going to introduce a little bit of notation here given a variable interpretation little theta we can write little theta comma big X for alpha to mean that we extend the type, uh, the type interpretation little theta with an interpretation big X for the variable alpha. Okay, and so with this notation, with this little bit of notation and this idea that we, if we had an, a semantic type interpretation a ver uh, for all of the type variables, then we'll be able to interpret all of these derivations to get a uh, to get a, uh, um, a logical relation. So let's take a look. And so what we're going to do is give a type interpretation. And so this is a variation on this definition of logical relations. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, if you give me a well-formed type, so a typing, a well-formedness derivation for a type, and you tell me how to interpret all of the variables, what I will do is I will give you a semantic type. And so there's going to be three cases for this because there's three cases for these uh, um, type well formedness derivations. So the base case is when we have a type variable. So if we have an, a little alpha, then we know that uh, as a type, we know that little alpha has to occur in the list of type variables big theta. And if we have a little theta, which has an interpretation for all of these variables in big theta, we can get a semantic type just by looking it up in that interpretation. So we'll say, well, we want an interpretation for alpha, and the way we'll get it is by finding the interpretation for alpha in, this, in the variable type interpretation. And then what we can do is for the uh, function case, if we have a, a well-formedness derivation that says A or OB is a well-formed type in with a uh, 
assignment of type variables little theta for all of the variables in big theta, then what we can do is we can say, well, I want it to contain every expression such that e halts and for every argument e prime in the interpretation of a, the application e e prime is in the interpretation b. And so you can see that this clause is actually identical to the clause for the logical relation for the simply typed lambda calculus. The only difference is that it's carrying along this variable interpretation because type variables may occur inside of A or they may occur inside of B. And we need to remember which, uh, which interpretation to give to each type variable. So sort of all of the action for the interpretation of system F happens in the interpretation of the polymorphic type constructor. So if we want to interpret the type for all alpha dot b in a, it, with a, uh, a variable type assignment little theta, what we want to do is we want to say it's every halting term e such that for every syntactic type a and every semantic type x, we want e applied to a in the interpretation of b where we interpret all of the, where we extend the variable type interpretation with the semantic type X. And one unusual feature of this definition is that we don't assert any kind of link between this capital syntactic type capital A and this semantic type capital X. So what's going on here is that naively you might expect to say something like, okay, for any type A, what I want to do is I want to replace the interpretation of alpha with the interpretation of big A. And the trouble with doing that is that if you did it, if you did that, then this definition would not be well founded. We're doing things by uh, recursion on the structure of this typing derivation and this definition, this clause right here is well defined because B with alpha as a free variable is smaller than for all alpha dot B. But if we had chosen a syntax, but, the, but that doesn't put a restriction on this A. So if A was a much bigger syntactic type, then if we tried to interpret it right here, then our, uh, our definition would become circular. So what we do here is we're doing an, a sort of over approximation. We're saying, well, the type that we really want is the interpretation of A, but we're going to let you choose anything you like. So we're going to quantify over all A and any possible semantic type, and it still has to be in the relation. And so if you do that, then this definition is non-circular. And one of the surprises of system F is that this definition of types works perfectly and there's no, no problem at all. And sort of the reason is that when you look at the reduction rules of system F, it, it's never the case that you branch on the syntactic type. So when you do a type application, the only thing it's there for is bookkeeping on the typing annotations. It never actually changes the real reduction behavior of the program. Okay, and so then once we have this uh, interpretation of type of type well formedness derivations, we'll be able to prove all of the properties that we expect. We'll be able to prove that if theta is an assignment of semantic types to all of the variables in big theta, then the interpretation of theta tells us that A is a well-formed type is going to be a semantic type. And we'll be able to show that if we rearrange the variables in the type variable context, their interpretations will remain unchanged. And we'll be able to show exactly this substitution property that we saw before. Well, sorry, before we get to the substitution property, we have to, we can also prove the weakening property. So if A is well typed under a context theta, then it's still going to be well typed under a uh, extended con a context extended with a variable alpha and the val the the valuation you get out the semantic type that you get out is going to be exactly the same so since a does not use alpha the the semantic type interpreting alpha doesn't affect the interpretation
and then we'll put all those three things together and we'll prove that substitution is sound for type variables. So the interpret so if A is a well-formed type and B is a well-formed type with a whole of a whole alpha, then when you substitute, the interpretation of a substitution uh, A for alpha in B is equal to the interpretation of B when you extend the interpretation uh, little theta with the interpretation uh, a for little alpha. And each of these properties, it can be proved by an induction on the type will form in this derivation. So it's like three cases for each of these. Okay, and so what, will I, what I'll do in the remainder of the lecture is show you how to prove some of the closure and uh, the other properties of the logical relation. So the closure lemma says that if theta assigns, little theta assigns a semantic type to each variable in big theta, then the interpretation of the, well, type well formedness derivation, theta, big theta tells us that for all alpha dot a is a type applied to little theta, that thing is still a type. And so what we want to show is that uh, if e steps to e prime, then E, uh, e is in the interpretation of for all alpha dot a if and only if uh, e prime is. So we want to show that the interpretation of for all alpha dot a is closed under uh, reduction. And so what we'll do is I'll just show one direction of this. So if e steps to e prime and e prime is in the, uh, is in the interpretation of for all alpha dot a, then we, what we want to do is we want to show that e is in this interpretation. And to show that, we'll need to unfold some definitions. So the definition of the interpretation function for, uh, for all alpha dot a will tell us that for any syntactic type c and any semantic type x, e prime c is in the interpretation of A in little theta with uh, alpha bound to X. And so now what does that mean? Well, now we, what we want to do is we want to show that this, this same thing holds for E. And so what we'll do is we'll fix an arbitrary uh, syntactic type C and an arbitrary semantic type X. And now what we know is that e prime c is in the interpretation of a with little theta and little alpha mapped to big X. Okay, and because this is a smaller typing derivation, we can, uh, we can appeal to induction. But before we do that, first we'll notice that e c steps to e prime c, and because um, because we know by induction that congruence holds at the type a, that tells us that E C is in the type A when it's when it's uh, interpreted at little theta with alpha mapped to big X, and that tells us because we chose an arbitrary C in X that it holds for any C in any X, and that is precisely the definition of the for all type interpretation, and so we know that E is in the uh, interpretation of for all alpha dot a. So from the fact that e prime was in the interpretation, we were able to get that the uh, that the that e was in the interpretation as well. Okay, and so this gives us the closure property. And now or it gives us one half of the closure property, but the other direction is extremely similar. It's almost the case that you just swap around the e and the e prime. And to prove now we can uh, we can prove substitution. And so this is a significantly trickier proof. Um, still not hard, but it's a bit fiddly. So we assume. So what we, so the way that you prove that two sets are equal. So recall that the interpretation of a of a type is a set of terms, and we want to prove that these two sets of terms uh, for all interpretation of for all beta dot b 
with theta extended with the interpretation of A is equal to uh, the interpretation of A for alpha and for all beta dot B. Okay, and so the way that we might prove this is by showing that if E is some arbitrary expression E is in this set right here, it will be in that set right there as well and vice versa. Okay, so let's just show one direction of this. We'll show the inclusion in this direction. So assume that E is in the uh, interpretation of for all beta dot B when the variable interpretation assigns uh, the interpretation of A for alpha. Okay, and so what we want to show is that E is in the interpretation of A for alpha for all beta dot B. Okay, and so now we're going to assume the definition of our assumption one. And so this is a for all type. So what we know is that for any syntactic C and semantic X, EC is in the interpretation of theta alpha beta uh, for the type B in this, uh, in this extended context. And so to, we know this fact for three, and the thing we want to prove for two is that for any C and X, EC is in the interpretation of theta B with A for alpha and B. This is just the definition of, of uh, what, what the semantics of this interpretation function is. Okay, and so what we'll do is we'll fix an arbitrary C and X, and then we will use our assumption in three, and so we'll conclude that EC is in the interpretation of B when uh, alpha is mapped to the interpretation of A and beta is mapped to this uh, um, arbitrary semantic type X. Okay, and we happen to know that permuting the variables in a type variable context won't change the semantics. And so we can appeal to the exchange lemma to say, well, so we know that EC is in theta comma B comma alpha turnstile B type. So in that interpretation. So all we've done is we've used the equality of these two interpretations to move the uh, move where we put this variable. And then look over here. We also have we're also doing that we're learning. We also are assuming that alpha is getting replaced with theta turnstile a for type. And the weakening lemma tells us that if we weaken this typing derivation to include a useless uh, variable beta, this interpretation right here is going to equal this interpretation uh, right here. So the interpretation with theta, uh, a under theta is going to be the same as the interpretation of a under theta comma b. So we don't use B, so we can give it any interpretation we like. And in specific, specifically, we can choose X. And then by induction, what we know is now, now this fact is in the shape of our induction lemma. So our induction lemma said that uh, this, the, this type right here is equal to that type right there. And so we've learned this fact by induction. And so now, because we proved this for an arbitrary C and X, we know that it holds for any C and X. And so therefore we've established, uh, we've established the thing that we wanted to show. And so we can do something similar for each of the other cases of the well-typing derivations in both directions. And once we have those semantic facts about substitution into semantic types, we will be able to prove a fundamental lemma. And so the fundamental lemma is going to be augmented. And it has to be augmented because the typing judgment for system F is a little bit more complicated. So a derivation that E has a type B happens under a context of type variables theta and a context of term variables gamma. And we need that context of term variables gamma to be well formed under uh, big theta. And then semantically, we're going to want a little theta, which interprets big theta. And we also want an assignment of term variables that says, okay, I want some expressions EI for every XI such that EI is in the semantics of A sub I under this interpretation little theta.
And then once we have all these things, we can prove by induction on the derivation uh, on the typing derivation of e having the type b that when you substitute all everything, you get something in the semantic type of b. So we end up with something in the semantic type of b, and if all of this big theta and big gamma were empty, we would learn that E is in the interpretation of B, and that tells us it terminates regardless of the type. So for any well-formed type, if you have a term of that type, then that, program, then that term will terminate. Um, obviously, I'm glossing over a lot, awful lot, but I'm also, in a, in a sense, not glossing over very much. So if you've done the proof for the simply typed lambda calculus, you'll find that once you've introduced this notion of semantic type and interpreting what type well formedness derivations, that all the proofs of termination for system F will go through in almost exactly the same way. So you've learned enough so far to prove one of the most important discoveries in type theory in the last 50 years. And I think that is really quite cool. So thank you all for coming to this lecture or watching this lecture on YouTube. Thank you.